Hello, I'm Kim Eagle from Ann Arbor, Michigan for ACC.org, and we're covering day two of the American Heart Association meetings in Philadelphia, November 12th. There's a lot of great science being presented. We're going to cover three trials today that we think are very important. I'm joined today by three experts in clinical trials, uh, Ajay Kirtani from New York City, Pyle Coley from Denver, Colorado, and uh, Durham Kambani, who's from uh, Dallas. Um, of all the trials today, uh, I just love the names, of course. And the first one I picked was Azalea Timmy 71. Durham, tell us about this one. Yeah, thanks. This is a very interesting and promising trial. Uh, this is a novel agent, abacitimab, and this is a phase two trial that is assessing um, the safety and efficacy of two doses uh, of abacitimab, 150 milligrams and 90 milligrams, compared with rivaroxaban among patients who had um, AFib and had an indication for anticoagulation and a high chads vas score. Um, and so uh, abacitimab, just very interestingly, this is a, a fully human monoclonal antibody against FACT11, uh, and it targets uh, the intrinsic cascade uh, compared with the factor 10A agents such as uh, river oxaban. And, uh, and so, you know, there is sort of at least theoretically the, the, the possibility that you may be able to uh, sort of only target the pathological side of the clotting cascade and then leave intact the physiological aspect, uh, which would be the extrinsic cascade. So this was a randomization uh, one to one to one, uh, about 1,200 patients. And interestingly, you know, the trial was actually terminated early uh, because of overwhelming benefit in terms of bleeding in favor of abacitimab. And so um, the the you know the uh, what they noted is uh, the primary endpoint, which was uh, major bleeding or clinically relevant non-major bleeding, was significantly reduced by both doses of abacitimab compared with placebo. Uh, there was a greater than seventy percent reduction in this bleeding and. You know, the predominant reductions were noted uh, in GI bleeding, actually, uh, although intracranial bleeding was also uh, lower, but just uh, sort of low across the trial. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the setting of a phase two trial, uh, they did not observe any differences in the ischemic endpoints of stroke or systemic embolism. So this is a very promising novel agent. This will be studied further uh, and, uh, you know, has actually been studied for uh, venous thromboembolic disease. And so in the ANT studies, for example, this has been studied for uh, prevention of uh, venous thromboembolic events post-total knee replacement. Um, and uh, in this sort of the AFib realm, uh, there, there's another study called the lilac timmy 76 trial, which is now enrolling, and will be enrolling patients who have uh, AFib but are not candidates for anticoagulation, and they'll be uh, randomized uh, to abacitimab versus placebo. So again, I think this is a very promising trial. This seems to be a very promising agent. Uh, and uh, as discussed, you know, there were no big safety signals that they uh, that they found. And so look forward to hearing more about this agent uh, in the days to come. Pyle, did you have a comment about this important trial? You, you know, I was really fascinated by it, Kim, for a couple of reasons. And Durham did a great job summarizing it. But first, it's an antibody mechanism. So it's a once a month injection. So we're really shifting the way we think about oral anticoagulation now. It's not a once a day pill, but that does raise the question of safety to me. If somebody has to go for urgent surgery or what have you, how would you clear those antibodies? So certainly something to think about down the line. And as Durham said, this allows us to sort of have our cake and eat it too, because we don't impair the, the hemostasis, but we do impair that initial clot. So maybe it really is the magic pill that we need for atrial fibrillation. Well, we'll see. I, I was impressed that you could even pronounce the name, Darum, and uh, great coverage. Appreciate that very much. Now let's go to the well for a very interesting trial called Artesia. Ajay? Look, I think it's a perfect uh, segue, in fact, because one of the challenges that comes up with atrial fibrillation is this issue of bleeding. And that's whole, the whole premise of these factor 11 inhibitors is that maybe you could reduce bleeding. Well, what was actually studied in this trial was a 4,000 patient trial looking at patients with subclinical atrial fibrillation. So these are folks that had had detected AF either on an ICD, a pacemaker, or a monitor that wasn't greater than 24 hours. It was less than that. And this is a very common scenario for our clinicians, especially with more monitoring and more readily apparent monitor, uh, available monitoring these days. What do you do with these patients? Do we, do we anticoagulate them? They have no symptoms. They know, you know they're at risk. And these were patients in the trial that had a chads vas score of three or greater or they were elderly, 70 years or greater, or a prior stroke. So 
they're at risk. You detect some subclinical AF and what do you do? So in this trial, 4,000 patients were randomized to aspirin 81 milligrams, where the more conservative approach was with respect to bleeding, versus a pixaban at the conventional doses, either 5 BID or 2.5 by label. And patients were followed over time. This trial actually couldn't enroll the full amount of events, but nonetheless, it was powered and simultaneously published in the Newell Journal, demonstrating that there was a reduction in ischemic events, uh, specifically stroke or venous thromboembolism, among those patients randomized to anticoagulation. Now, it was not a free lunch, though. There was an increase in bleeding, major bleeding, um, in that group as well in comparison to the aspirin. Um, so the question is, well, what do we do? Because we have to balance these risks. What I like that the investigators did is they actually subset it out a little bit, the consequences of some of these bleeding events. And the vast majority of them were treated. They did not result in an excess of fatal bleeding. And so their argument was that this was an indication to anticoagulate these patients because most of the bleeding could be treated. I think we know from historical studies in, in, our, in our space that bleeding is not to be underrated, and it's certainly important, especially when the mean age of patients is 75 as in this trial. And I think that's why there's a lot of hope for other agents potentially out there that might be able to sort of thread the needle, if you will, between ischemic and bleeding events. Great summary. And I, I really agree with you. It's a double-edged sword. This is really where the doctor-patient interaction is key. And, and sometimes the patients will value one endpoint over another and help us make that decision. And with the digital technology around us now, the smartwatches and Fitbits and so forth, having more and more information about asymptomatic atrial fibrillation is going to be key to making good decisions for our patients. The other trial we wanted to cover today was a, a trial called Reprieve. Uh, Pyle, do you want to tell us about this? Yeah, what I love about this trial, Kim, is it's sort of a back to basics. We spend a lot of time looking at clinical outcomes, but this takes us back to mechanism in HIV patients. So the results of the parent trial, the parent reprieve trial, have been previously published, and they showed that pitavastatin reduced MACE by 35% over a median time of five years in patients who had HIV. Now, we know HIV patients get more heart disease, about one and a half to two times higher risk of heart disease, and they have more non-calcified plaque. But that risk reduction that we got of 35% was out of proportion to what we would have predicted based on the ctt uh, LDL relationship. So that would have been an anticipated risk reduction of about 17%. But the fact that it came out to 35% suggests that there may be some non-LDL mechanisms by which we could be seeing this MACE benefit. So this trial took a deep dive to look at that plaque using coronary CT angiograms, look at inflammatory biomarkers in the plaque to try to understand why that might be. And what they found is that in a population with HIV that's at low to moderate cardiovascular disease risk, 24 months of pitabastatin reduced non-calcified plaque volume by 7% and reduced the risk of plaque progression by 33%. And I thought that those were really impressive numbers. Now, for people, the subgroups that already had plaque at baseline, that reduction in non-calcified plaque volume was actually as high as 12%. And then when you look at those biomarkers, you actually saw a reduction in lipid oxidation and arterial inflammation biomarkers. So I'm talking about oxidized LDL and LPPLA2. Now, interestingly, high sensitivity CRP, which we know is amped up in patients with uh, HIV and can also be modulated by statins, was reduced. There was a trend towards reduction, but this was not clinically significant. So to me, you know, we've really sort of started to get at the mechanisms of how we're resulting in clinical benefit. And we've seen some of this before with other lipid lowering agents. We've seen the evaporate trial with icosapentethyl that looked at plaque morphology, where we see increased fibrous cap thickness, less lipid arc. We've seen um, Pac-Man with alirucumab. We've seen Huygens with evolucumab. So I feel like all of, all of the data is really consistently telling us that we're not just reducing clinical events. We're not just reducing LDL, but we're actually changing plaque morphology. And what I like to say to my patients when I'm starting them on these types of medications, and I'll certainly say this to my patients with HIV, is that we are changing this from plaque that you're going to die from to plaque that you're going to die with. So we're really trying to stabilize that plaque, reduce inflammation, and really change that plaque phenotype to improve cardiovascular events. Great coverage of that trial. I, I just, you know, I, I was thinking about the patients who were in this trial and, uh, you know, they went through a lot to help us understand the biology of what's happening. And for all these trials, both the trialists and the patients who enroll and are followed, 
you know, this this is the sword of science, isn't it? That we get this this group of people together and we and we push and push and push to find both results but also mechanisms. And this trial really, really exemplified that. So we talked about Azalea, we talked about Artesia, and we finished up with this interesting trial called Reprieve. Great summaries from all of you. Thank you so much. And this will conclude our day two coverage at the American Heart Association, Kim Eagle for ACC.org. And I'm out. <laughs>